Chapter Five of The Windy Hill by Cornelia Meggs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. The Ghost Ship. Cicely Hallowell sighed deeply as she pushed away the heap of papers before her and brushed back the hair from her aching forehead. She was weary of her task, and the room was growing dark and cold. She was beginning, moreover, to be uneasily conscious that the two men at the far end of the long table had forgotten her presence behind the pile of great ledgers, and were talking of things that she was not meant to hear. Half an hour earlier her brother Alan had rushed in to see whether she were not ready for their afternoon ride, and had been disappointedly impatient when she shook her head. "'It is a glorious day, so cold and the roads so deep in snow. The horses are like wild things, and will give us a famous gallop up the valley. Oh, do come, Cicely!' But no, she must stay in the big gloomy counting-house, to finish the letters that she had promised to copy for her father, while Alan had flung off, saying over his shoulder as he departed to take his ride alone, "'It is very wrong to miss fun and adventure by toiling and moiling here. Think how the sea will look, and how the blasts will be blowing over our windy hill.' The place seemed very cheerless and empty after he had gone. The long windows gave little light on that grey winter afternoon, and the big fireplace with its glowing logs was at the far end of the room. There were shadows already on the shelves of heavy ledgers lining the walls, and on the rows of ship's models all up and down the sides of the big counting-room. Those lines of dusty volumes held records that Alan was forever reading, tales of wonderful voyages, of spice and gold-dust and jewels brought home from the Orient, of famines in far lands broken by the coming of American grain-ships, of profits reckoned in ducats and doubloons and Spanish pieces of eight. Cicely was fond of drawing, and loved, far more than copying dull letters, to make sketches of those miniature vessels in the glass cases that stood for the Hallowell ships that had scoured the oceans of the world. They had been wrecked on coral reefs in hot distant seas, they had lain becalmed with priceless cargoes in pirate-infested waters. Their crews were as skillful with the long guns as they were at handling the sails. Their captains were as at home in Shanghai or Calcutta as they were in the streets of the little seaport town where they had been born. Cicely could remember when the big counting-room had been crowded with clerks and had hummed like a beehive with the myriad activities of the Hallowell trade. It was a dull and empty place now, and the fleet of Hallowell ships was scattered, some lying at anchor, some dismantled and sold, some fallen into the hands of the enemy. For this was the third year of that struggle with England that the histories were to call the War of 1812. Cicely, for all her thirteen years, looked very small, sitting there at the end of the long table, in her sprigged high-waisted gown, her feet in their strapped slippers perched on the rung of the high office stool. She had just taken up her pen to begin writing again, when the voices of the two men by the fire rose so suddenly that she dropped it, startled. Her father's tone fell almost immediately to strained quiet, but Martin Hallowell, his partner, went on with angry insistence. She knew him to be hot-headed and impetuous, but she had never heard such words from him before. With a quick, eager motion that was the embodiment of impatient greed, Marden was running his finger down the columns of the ledger before him. "'There is no ship like a privateer, and no privateer like the Huntress,' he was saying. "'Send her on one more voyage, and we shall be rich men!' There was an ugly tremor in his voice, that quavered and broke in spite of his attempts to keep it calm. "'I do not care to be one of those who gathers riches from a war,' returned Reuben Hallowell, Cicely's father. There was something in the dry calm of his answer that seemed to stir Marden to uncontrollable anger. 
It is like you, Reuben Hallowell, he said, to be willing to ruin my plans by your foolish scruples just when a real prize is within reach. But I vow you shall not do it. You shall be a wealthy man in spite of yourself. And let me remind you that two years ago, before we built the Huntress, you were a precious poor one. The Hallowell partners were not brothers but cousins, with Cicely's father much the older of the two. They had inherited the business from their fathers, for such an ill-assorted pair would never have been joined together from choice. Many of their discussions ended in stormy words, but never before had Martin's dark face showed such white-hot quivering rage as when he arose now, gathered up his papers, and went away to his own room, closing the door smartly behind him. Cicely got up also, and went down the long counting-room to where her father sat by the fire. "'I heard what you and Cousin Martin were saying,' she told him hesitatingly. "'I am afraid you did not remember that I was there, but it does not matter, for I did not understand what Cousin Martin was so angry about.' "'There is no reason why you should not understand.' her father replied, rather slowly and wearily, she thought, although sometimes I am not certain that I understand these troubled times myself. Across the seas, the Emperor Napoleon, a long-nosed, short-bodied man of infinite genius for setting the world by the ears, has been warring with England for the last ten years and more. He and the British, with their blockades and embargoes and orders in council, have long been striving to ruin each other, yet have achieved their greatest success in ruining a peaceable old gentleman in America who relies on his ships to bring him a livelihood. To oppress neutral shipping leads in the end to war, although I vow that often Congress must have felt that it should toss up a penny to determine whether the declaration should be against France or England. Some stubborn British minister, however, decided to countenance the stealing of sailors from our ships, to fill up the scanty crews of their own navy, and a stubborn British nation felt that it must back him. So, in the end, the war was with England. "'And have we not won many glorious victories?' asked Cicely. "'Aye, there have been victories. Out of her fleet of seven hundred and thirty sail, England has lost a handful to us, and we have shown how small our navy is and how great is its spirit.' There have been passages of arms on land also, of which we do not love to talk. And we have sent out our privateer vessels, armed ships that prey upon England's commerce, yet do not belong to our navy. They have done great things, have cut deep into England's overseas trade, and have brought home many a valuable prize to fill the pockets of their owners. Such a vessel is our huntress, built at your cousin Martin's instigation, and launched at the moment when our fortunes were at their lowest ebb. Since we had not sufficient funds to equip her, nearly every one in this town put money into her, from John Harwood the minister down to Jack Marvin who digs our garden. It was a patriotic venture, and a risky one, but she has brought home great profits and prize money, and our own share has re-established the firm of Hallowell. Your cousin Martin says that one more voyage will bring us not only profit but real wealth. But I say, he struck his hand suddenly upon the table, I say there shall not be another. Why? The question was startled from Sicily by his sudden vehemence, yet it was not from him that she was to receive the answer. The door opened to admit Martin Hallowell, who had come back apparently for a last word. You say, he began at once, that the huntress needs refitting and cannot be made seaworthy in less than a month. His partner nodded. I say that she shall sail in a week, declared Marden. And I say no, cried Reuben Hallowell. You say, too, that the war is nearly over, that the Peace Commission is sitting at Ghent, and that rumors are coming home that they are near to an agreement. That is your excuse for wishing to keep our privateers at home. You are a foolish and an overscrupulous man, Reuben Hallowell, for I say that such a reason makes all the more haste for her to be gone. 
We should reap what profit we can while there is yet time. He leaned forward, his dark, eager face close to theirs, all caution forgotten in the intensity of his purpose. Once at sea, the huntress is beyond reach of tidings or orders. If she should take her last and richest prizes a little after peace has been declared, who will ever know it? He was silent and stood staring at them with unwavering, defiant eyes. Cicely could hear her sharply drawn breath as she waited for her father to answer. "'We are partners no longer, Martin Hallowell,' he said. "'We were not born to work together, and it is clear that we have come to the parting of the ways. Tomorrow we will make division of our holdings.' for I tell you plainly that I will have no more to do with you and your dishonest schemes. It shall be as you say, Martin agreed, quick to press home an advantage. And since it was I who urged the building and launching of the huntress, it is only proper that she should fall to my chair. She shall sail this day week, as I have told you. And you, my dear cousin, for your effort to stop her shall soon be a most regretful man. He went out, this time closing the door very gently behind him. The echoes of his vague threat seemed to hang in the great room long after he was gone. What, what can he do? questioned Cicely. Her father, with a visible effort, answered cheerfully, an angry man loves to threaten, but we have naught to fear from him. And now, he gathered the big ledger under his arm, I must work for a little in the counting-room, and then we will go home. Cicely, left alone, went back to fetch her letters, and stopped for a moment at one of the long windows to look down upon the harbour where the huntress dipped and swayed at anchor, a stately, beautiful thing that seemed to quiver with life as she rocked in the choppy seas, her shimmering reflection beginning to be colored by the sunset, rocking and dancing with her. "'Oh, I must draw it!' cried Cicely, catching up a sheet of fresh paper. "'If only the light holds, and the ship does not swing round with the tide!' The minutes passed while she worked eagerly, but finally was forced to lay down her pencil, unable to see more in the dusk. The door flew open, and someone came in with the impulsive rush that belonged only to her brother Alan. "'What, Cicely, still here, and trying to draw in the dark? Let me see what you have done,' he exclaimed. He lit a candle and examined the paper. "'I vow that is good. Oh, Cicely, that huntress is a wonderful ship!' For some reason, there was a cold clutch at Cicely's heart. Yes, she answered faintly. I have just had such a talk with Cousin Marden, the boy went on excitedly. I did not quite understand the way of it, but he said that he and my father were to divide, and that the huntress was to be his own entire. He wants me to go with her on her next voyage. He says the war is not nearly done, and that there will be many months of fighting and prize-taking still. He thinks a great fellow of sixteen like me should have been a ship's officer long ago, and I think so too. What a good fellow Cousin Martin is! Alan admired his elder cousin greatly, Cicely well knew. And he had, indeed, a touch of the same excitable, headstrong nature. She could well understand how Martin Hallowell had dazzled the boy with tales of what he would see and do. Had there been such a plan in her cousin's mind when he first uttered his threat against her father? Or had it only flashed upon him as he met Alan running up the stairs, eager, vigorous, and ready for any adventure? "'It is all arranged,' declared Alan, except just to tell my father. "'No, no!' she cried wildly, but he did not even listen. "'I will go in and speak to him now,' he said. She could not even cry out as the door closed behind him. Alan had his father's stern and steady pride, but there were differences of temperament that led to frequent clashes of will between them. 
Reuben Hallowell loved both his motherless children, but he understood his son less well than his daughter. What would be the result of that interview, Cicely wondered, sitting quaking beside the candle that burned so lonely in the gloom? Would her father know how to be firm and patient, how to undo the harm that Martin Hallowell had wrought? It seemed, as she sat there, shivering, that she could not endure the suspense. She had not long to wait. The door banged open, and Alan stood for a moment on the threshold. "'My father forbids my sailing on the Huntress. I have told him I should go in spite of him,' he said. He walked away along the corridor and down the stone steps, his feet quicker and lighter than Martin Hallowell's, but his footsteps sounding in some vague, terrible way, like his cousin's, as he strode out and down the stairs. Her father came in a moment later. "'You should have been at home long since this, my child,' was all he said, and they went out together, without further talk of the matter, into the sharp air of the snowy night. At the corner of the steep, narrow street, Cicely caught sight of Martin Hallowell, talking to a man whom she recognized as an old seaman who had sailed for years upon the Hallowell ships. Something Martin had said must have angered the sailor, for he was talking loudly, regardless of who might hear. No, the old man was saying, there's not every one in the world will do your bidding, though you may think so. You can defy the old one and talk over the young one to go your way, but there's one man will not sail on any ship of yours, and that's Ben Barden. I'll starve ashore first. Cicely's quick ear caught his words as she and her father passed by on the other side of the snow-muffled street. It did not seem that Reuben Hallowell had heard. One day passed, two, three, four days, and Cicely's one thought was that the Huntress was to sail in seven. Workmen were swarming all over her like bees, hammering, caulking, and painting, yet it was plain that they could not do in a week what needed a month to finish. Alan was at the wharf all day, holding frequent conferences with his cousin. Reuben Hallowell went to and fro among the townspeople, urging them to say that the ship in which they were part owners must abide at home. But either because they were less sure of peace than he, or because their eyes were blinded by past good fortune and hopes of future gain, they would not listen. Between father and son no words were passed, since each was waiting for the other's stubborn pride to give way. On the fifth day Cicely had gone out to ride, on a clear snowy afternoon, with the white world shining before her, and with the highway iron hard under the horse's feet. She missed Alan sorely, for this was their favorite road, up the valley to the west of the town, as far as the round bare hill with the single oak tree that they liked to call theirs. The servant with her had dropped behind, and she was just turning her horse into the by-path leading to the hill, when she saw a sturdy figure coming down the slope. The brown face, tattooed hands, and the small bundle of possessions done up in a blue handkerchief could only be a sailor's, a sailor who proved to be Ben Barden. "'I'm going to the next seaport to find another berth, since I've refused to sail on the Huntress,' he explained in answer to her questions. "'Mr. Marden has had to get a new skipper and a new crew, for none of the old hands would sail when they heard it was against your father's wishes. There was a bark come in from Delaware to be laid up for repairs, with mostly Swedes aboard, and they have manned the Huntress from her. The ship is to sail on Friday at midnight, with the turning tide, but she goes without Ben Barden. He dropped his voice and came nearer. I will tell you this, though I should not, he said. There's someone to join at the last minute, who will get into a boat waiting at the wharf in the dark, someone you love, miss, who ought to be stopping ashore with the rest of us. You should find some way to keep him back. Oh, if only I could, she cried. There's only you can do it, he answered. Hallowell blood can only be ruled by Hallowell blood, as we say on Hallowell ships. Well, I'll be going on again. 
I had climbed the path there to take one more look at the harbor, where you can see it between the hills. Maybe your father will find a place for me when his vessels go to sea for trade again, and I'll never forget him nor you, Miss Cicely. Do you remember how you and your brother once hid under the wharf and called out from that echoing place as though you were lost souls out of the sea? There was one honest old sailorman that nearly lost his wits for terror, since we seafaring folk have no love for ghosts. Mark my words, there will no good come to the huntress from setting sail of a Friday. For that alone I would stay ashore, though there's other things to hold me too. He strode away down the snowy road, leaving Sicily, smiling at first at the recollection of that game that had so frightened him when she and her brother had played at ghosts, then grave in a moment when she thought how soon that brother was to be gone. On Friday, the day after tomorrow, he would sail unless she could stop him. But how could she? The next day she made the desperate effort of appealing to her father, but quite in vain. Reuben Hallowell would not believe either that the huntress would sail or that his son would go with her. And if Alan wishes to cut himself off from his own people for ever, let him, he said finally, unable to endure the thought that any one should dare to defy his will. Friday came. The shadows of Friday night stole through the big house, yet nothing had been done. Cicely sat by the fire in her chintz-hung bedroom, leaning back against the flowered cushions of the big armchair, gazing into the flames. In the next room she could hear vague sounds of Alan's preparations, feet going to and fro, a door opening and closing, a pair of heavy boots dropped upon the floor. The night was dark outside, with a blustering wind and occasional flurries of snow that struck sharply against the window. It was ten o'clock. The sounds had ceased, as though Alan had finished making ready, and was waiting, perhaps sitting silent in the dark, perhaps lying down for an hour or two of sleep before the fateful hour of the high tide. Cicely heard her father below, barring the door, putting out the candles, making ready for a night that would surely bring him no sleep. Presently he passed her door, glanced inside, and came in to stand for a minute beside her fire. How worn he had grown to look just within the space of this last week! He said scarcely a word. It was as though his unhappiness merely craved company and shrank from the knowledge of what the night might bring. At last, he said, You should be in bed. Good night, my dear. As he went out, he turned to look back at her with a glance of haggard, helpless misery. It was as though he said, My pride has bound and stifled me. I cannot speak a word to stop him, but won't you, can't you, persuade him somehow not to go? Very carefully, and without a sound, Cicely rose and went to her closet, to take down her warm fur cloak. She had realized, in the moment of seeing her father's pleading look, that she had a plan, one that had been in her mind ever since the day that she had talked with Ben Barden. What she had really lacked was courage to put it into execution. Yet now, as she drew the cloak about her and pulled down her hood, her hands did not even tremble, nor did her determination falter. The house was absolutely still as she stole noiselessly down the stairs and slipped out of the door. For a girl who had almost never been allowed upon the street alone, the wintry night should have been full of terrors, but to Cicely they meant nothing. As she ran down the steep high street with the gale blustering behind her, she saw things that she had never believed existed. A burly waterman quarreling with his wife behind a dirty lighted window, the open door of a tavern showing a candlelit room with a crowd of shouting sailors drinking within a furtive black shadow that skulked into an alleyway and remained there silent and hidden as she passed. She reached the wharves at last, where the wind was stronger and where the waves slapped and dashed against the barnacled piles, 
throwing their spray against the windows of the locked warehouses. Even now she did not hesitate. She ran, a grey flitting form, across the open space at the head of the wharf, and disappeared. There was a wait of a few minutes. Then came the dip of oars through the dark, and the sound of men's voices talking above the high wind. Martin Hallowell was coming ashore, in the boat that was to carry Alan away. Beyond them, the lights of the Huntress showed where she was getting up sail. Martin made the landing with some difficulty, climbed the ladder to the wharf, and stood bracing himself against the heavy wind. "'We are a little early,' he said. "'Hold fast there with the boat-hook. He will be here in a—' His voice was drowned by a strange sound, an unearthly wailing that seemed to rise from the water beneath, but which filled the air until there was no saying from what direction it came. It lifted and dropped, hung sobbing and echoing over the water, then died away. "'Holy St. Anthony, help us!' cried the nearest sailor. "'It is the soul of some poor drowned creature caught among the weeds!' "'Give way!' roared the man at the rudder, and with one accord the oars dropped into the water. "'Stop! Wait! It, it is nothing, you fools!' cried Marden Hallowell, but his own voice quavered with terror and carried little reassurance to the frightened men. The boat hung doubtfully a ship's length from the pier, the oars dipping to hold it into the wind, the men hesitating, ashamed of their terror, yet fearing to come closer. Again the cry broke forth, resounding again and again, mingling in terrible ghostly fashion with the splashing and gurgling of the water. The boat shot away into the dark, just as Alan came running down the wharf, shouting to them to come back. The sailors, however, bent to their oars, unheeding. The lantern in the stern dipped and jerked as they rowed away, and the light finally went out of sight as the boat drew alongside the huntress. It was just possible to make out the big ship as she weighed anchor, and rolling and plunging, moved slowly out into the tideway. "'She's gone! Without me!' cried Alan. "'Oh, they might have come back, the cowards!' "'Did you hear that, that terrible sound?' asked Martin Hallowell. In a second's pause between the breaking of two waves, it was possible to hear his teeth chatter. "'Terrible!' cried Alan in disgust. "'That was only my sister Cicely hiding under the wharf. It was a game we once played to frighten Ben Barden. "'Come out!' he ordered sternly, kneeling down and thrusting an arm into the dark space to help her. Out Cicely came, wet and shivering, with her hair streaked with mud and her hands scratched and cut by the sharp barnacles. Her face showed white in the dark as she looked up appealingly at her brother, but he turned from her without a sign. Before she could follow him, Martin Hallowell had seized her by the arm. You! he cried. You! He shook her until she was dizzy, until the dark, windy world spun before her eyes. He cried out at her with a terrible voice, and with words that she only half understood. All the rage stored up within him during his bitter struggle to get his ship under way, all the baffled hopes of his small-spirited revenge, all the shame for his recent terror broke forth into blind fury against the girl who had stood in his way. "'I will teach you!' he shouted, grasping her arm tighter until she winced with pain. "'I will show you that you can't!' His words were cut short by a stinging blow across the mouth from which he staggered back, dropping Cicely's arm and staring in gaping astonishment at his assailant. "'That is my sister!' said Alan, very stiff and quiet, and suddenly very like his father. Whatever she has done, you are not to touch her. She has ruined my chance of sailing with a huntress, but at least she has shown me what, what you are, Martin Hallowell. With his arm about Cicely, Alan went down the pier, while Martin, confounded and silenced, stood staring after them. The two said nothing as they climbed the high street, although much must have been passing in the boy's mind. 
as he pushed open their own door and came into the dusky hallway he spoke for the first time. "'Can you wait here by the fire a minute, Cicely? I am going up first to—to to tell my father what a fool I have been.' The weeks of winter passed. News came that peace had been signed on Christmas Eve. One after another, the ships of war came straggling home. Some had taken prizes, all had been harried by the winter storms, and none brought news of the huntress. One Carolina vessel that put in for repairs told of picking up a crew adrift in boats, and of setting them aboard a ship bound for Chesapeake Bay and the coast of Delaware. They were most of them Swedes, the sailors told Allen, and they were not very willing to talk of the ship they had lost, but it might have been the huntress. Reuben Hallowell was straining all his resources to send his idle ships to sea and to re-establish the trade of peace. Yet when he urged his fellow townsmen to strive to gain the commerce America had lost, lest it be gone forever, they still hung back. "'We must know first where we stand,' they said. "'There is hope still that we have not lost the huntress, and that she will come to port with fortune for us all.' A stormy February passed, and there came at last a gusty day of March. It was a Sunday, with the air clean after a shower, and with all the townspeople moving down the high street from their churches at the hour of noon. There had been a tempest of wind and rain, but it had cleared, leaving the waters still grey, but with the sky turning to blue. Cicely was among the first, walking with her father and brother and had stopped as they came to their own door to glance down at the harbour laid out in a circle of moving blue water below them. "'Oh, look, look!' she cried suddenly. A ship was sailing slowly up the bay, a stately ship that dipped a little and rose again as she came, but held her course steady for the wharves. Her sails shone white in the fitful sun, the lines of her hull showed dark against the grey water, the tracery of her rigging, and even the colours of her flag were distinct against the sky, and yet she did not seem like any ship they had ever seen before. Cicely, having drawn that vessel line for line, masts, hull, ropes, and spars, knew that this was the huntress, yet what was so strange about her? Why was she so steady in those changing gusts of wind? What was there that made her sails so shining and transparent like the texture of a cloud? The girl was aware that among the crowd that had gathered to watch the strange vision, Martin Hallowell was pushing to the front, gazing with all his eyes. Ben Barden, too, who had come back the week before to ask for a place on Reuben Hallowell's ships, was pressing close to Alan's elbow. The wind's dead offshore, and here she comes straight in, she heard the old sailor mutter. Not even the huntress could sail like that, and yet it is the huntress right enough. The vessel came nearer and nearer, then of a sudden stopped, quivered as though struck by a violent adverse wind. Her main topsail blew out suddenly and went streaming forth in the gale, a jib split to ribbons before their eyes and spar after spar was carried away. She careened as though before a hurricane, her foremast came down with a soundless smother of sail and wreckage. Further and further she tilted, and then suddenly she had vanished, and there was nothing left but the March sunshine and the tossing empty bay. The crowd stood breathless, waiting for someone to speak. It was only Ben Barden who was able to find his voice. "'I've heard of such things before,' he said. "'The wise skippers all say it is a mirage, but the wiser sailormen say it is a message from another world. She's gone, our huntress is, and there's no wind under heaven will ever blow her home again.' Martin Hallowell had swung on his heel, and was walking away down the street, facing the fact, finally, that his venture was at an end. A tall man with dangling watch-seals edged up to Cicely's father. "'I am satisfied at last, Reuben Hallowell, that our ship is lost,' he said. 
we did wrong to wait for war to make our fortunes, and it is high time that we went back to the lesser risks and the smaller gains of peace. Will you let me join in lading your next vessel? You are the only man among us who has known when a war ends and peace begins. I'm thinking there will be some tall ships sailing out of this port soon, said Ben Barden, speaking low to Sicily and Allen. It will be on a better craft than the Huntress even that your brother will be officer before long. What seas will cruise, he and I, and what treasures we'll bring back to you, Miss Sicily? I'd go with the son of Reuben Hallowell to the ends of the earth, if only he never asks me to put to sea of a Friday. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of the Windy Hill by Cornelia Meggs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Janet's Adventure. Throughout the telling of the story, Polly and Janet had been very busy sorting and putting together the little honey boxes that were to be set in larger frames and hung in the upper story of the beehives. There was now such a great heap of them ready that the bee-man gathered them into a basket, and summoning Oliver to help him, carried them outside. He did not immediately go down the slope to the beehives, but set the basket on the step, and sat down on the bench beside it. "'You had something to tell me,' he said, "'something that disturbed and excited you. I thought it might be better for you to wait a little. I should like to hear it now.' "'Yes, it is clearer in my head now,' Oliver agreed. "'It is about my cousin Jasper that we are visiting. I want to help him, though—' He smiled at the recollection, yet made frank confession. "'That first day I was here, I was so angry I almost hated him.' "'If I thought that were true,' responded his friend gravely, "'I should have to ask you never to come here again. Not only because I am fond of your cousin myself, but because I value my bees. There is an old superstition that you must not hate where bees are, for they feel it and pine away and die. I cannot have my bees destroyed. The boy, looking up quickly at his broad friendly smile, realized that the man believed neither the old superstition nor that Oliver entertained any evil feelings. Perhaps, went on the bee-man, the bees were in some danger that first day. You had it in mind, then, to go away for good, I think. Oliver nodded. He wondered how he could ever have made that selfish resolution to run away. How did you know? he asked. I had guessed it from, oh, various things. I am about the age of your cousin Jasper, but I know more than he about people of your years from being Polly's father. I even had some idea of what was the immediate cause of your going." The boy flushed so guiltily that he went on in kindly haste. "'I am troubled about Jasper Payton myself. Yes, don't look surprised. I know him well enough to call him that. We all know one another in Medford Valley. I—I I even work for him sometimes. Now tell me what you think is wrong." Oliver, as he set forth his tale, had a feeling that not all of it was new to his listener, but he hearkened attentively to all that the boy had to say, frowning when he heard of Anthony Crawford's insistent and disagreeable visits. "'Your cousin doesn't know how to deal with a man like that,' he commented. He is too upright himself to know the mean, small, underhand ways that such a person will take to get what he wants. I know Anthony Crawford, too, and what he is trying to accomplish. It will take all of us, every one, to beat him. But we will, Oliver, I vow we will." "'What can we do? What can I do?' the boy persisted. He felt ready to accomplish great things at once. And can't you explain to me what it is all about?" To his great disappointment, the other shook his head. 
I feel that if your cousin does not wish to tell you himself, I ought not to, he said, though I should like you to know. But there are two things that you can do. One is not to be impatient with your cousin when he makes tactless mistakes about, about how you are to be entertained. He depends on you and Janet for a little cheerfulness in his house. That isn't much to do, observed Oliver. I hope the other is more. It is only this, to borrow a boat from John Massey. Can you manage a sailboat? Good, I thought you looked like the sort of boy who could. And take a cruise up and down Medford River where it skirts that level farming land in the valley. I want you to bring me word of how the dikes are holding. You may not see what bearing that has upon the matter, but I assure you it means a great deal. Anthony Crawford thinks that he is a very clever man, but he is preparing a pitfall for himself unless I am very much mistaken. And you and I may be at hand to see him tumble into it. The only thing is to see that he doesn't harm others as well as himself. Oliver had one more question to ask. I want to know your last name, and Polly's, he said. I can't think how you knew mine, and I had quite forgotten to wonder about yours, until Janet reminded me that I had never heard it. I have no name for you but the Bee Man. If you want a longer name for Polly, you can call her Polly Marshall, his friend answered. But as for me, I rather like being called the Bee Man. We will keep to that title a little longer if you are willing. And now, it is high time that I gave some attention to my bees. Oliver had no difficulty, later in the day, in borrowing the sailboat from John Massey, although he was obliged to give the vague message, That man who keeps bees up the hill said you would lend her to me. Sure I will, replied John Massey heartily. Just be careful you don't go aground on the bars. The river is shallow for this time of year, though it can be pretty fierce when the floods are up. Oliver shook out the shabby sail, set the rudder for a long tack downstream, and was off. The breeze was coming in gentle puffs, so that the boat moved slowly through the water, the ripples making a sleepy whisper under the bow, and the tiller now and then jerking lazily under his hand. One side of the stream was marshy, so that he pushed into tall grass and cattails, and startled an indignant kingfisher who was dozing on a dead tree. The bird went skimming off, a flash of blue and white that he followed as he came about. On the other side the current ran close beside the high banks of earth that protected the fields within. The channel was scoured deep, and the restless stream was cutting into the dikes, washing long black scars just above the water-line. "'That oughtn't to be,' pronounced Oliver, and was glad to see that farther downstream the carving away of the earth had been stopped by patches of broken stone. For at least a mile, however, at the bend of the river, the banks were crumbling and neglected. He could look up and see, first the farms of the low-lying land, the treetops and pointed silos just showing above the dike, then the hillside with the wavering white line of the road, then that strange shabby dwelling of yellow stone almost hidden in its cluster of trees. Above it showed Cousin Jasper's house, very big and red, set upon the slope almost at the top of the ridge. On the other side of the stream there were fewer dwellings, the wooded slope rising to the more open green of the orchard, and then to the grassy declivity of the windy hill. As he neared the bridge, he passed a long grey stone house, with its gardens a glowing mass of colour that came down to the water's very edge. This, he remembered, was the abode of Cousin Eleanor, and he laughed at himself, as even at this safe distance he steered his course very cautiously along the opposite bank. At the bridge he was obliged to turn, and run before the wind to make his way upstream again. He lay stretched out comfortably along the rail, paying little attention to the boat and thinking of many things. 
there was Cousin Jasper. How Oliver had misjudged him that day he thought of running away. His cousin had been tactless and stubborn, but the Cousin Eleanor affair had been well meant after all. "'I'll never meet her, though. I won't give in,' he declared, almost aloud, and realized in a breath that his persistence and Cousin Jasper's were both cut from the same piece. "'I'm sorry for him, and I'll help him,' he told himself, "'and perhaps he will learn something about boys after a while.' And there was Anthony Crawford. He flushed again as he thought of the man's gleeful delight when he had caught him looking over the wall. What power could he have, and what was the disgrace of which he had spoken? The bee-man was almost as mysterious as the others also. He had certainly managed to evade the question when Oliver had asked his name. "'The only one that there isn't a mystery about is Polly,' he declared as he came to John Massey's little landing, and rounded with a sweep to the boat's mooring. Meanwhile, Janet, who had been left to her own devices, had stumbled into an adventure of her own. She had made ready to go with her brother, but Cousin Jasper had called her to look at some new roses, and had delayed her so long that the impatient Oliver had finally gone without her. When Cousin Jasper had returned to the house, she wandered rather disconsolately up and down the hedged paths, and finally, coming to the big gate, she stood looking out. The road stretched away invitingly across the hillsides. The sleepy stillness of the afternoon was broken only by the occasional drone of a motor, and by the grinding wheels of a big hay-wagon that labored along the highway in the dust. She walked out along the road, thinking that she would find a vantage point to look down to the river and see how Oliver was faring. The way presently crossed an open ridge, whence she could see the smooth stream, and the sail creeping slowly out from the green shore. For some time she stood watching his progress, wishing vainly that she might have gone, until she became suddenly aware that someone was staring at her. Turning, she saw that a child, with very yellow hair and very round blue eyes, was sitting between two alder bushes on the edge of a ditch, gazing at her intently. "'What are you doing?' she asked, astonished, for the youngster, a square little boy of four or five years old, seemed far too small to be on the road alone. "'I was wishing I could go home,' he answered. There was a slight quivering of his chin as he spoke, as though the problem was rather a desperate one, but he was determined not to cry. "'I was wishing on that hay-wagon when it went by,' he explained sedately, I shut my eyes so I wouldn't see it again and break the lock, and when I opened them you were there." He climbed over the ditch, and came to her side to tuck his hand confidently into hers. There seemed to be no doubt in his mind that she would take him home. "'Can you show me where you live?' she asked as they went along together. "'Oh, yes,' he answered cheerfully. "'There was a cow eating beside the road, and I passed it once but it looked at me so hard when I went by that I was afraid to go back. I'll show you." They walked along for some distance, he tramping sturdily by her side, and chattering contentedly, giving her all sorts of miscellaneous and unsought information, that his name was Marden, that he had a little brother, that the brother was crying when he went away from home, that his mother was crying a little too, that they had a red calf in the barn, and that there was a scarecrow in the field beside their house. He led her into a crossroad, then down a narrow, shady lane, where, as he had said, there was a mannerly old black cow grazing beside the way, who came to the end of her tether rope to greet them. "'I'm not afraid with you here,' young Martin asserted boldly and was even persuaded to pat the smooth black-and-white face of the friendly creature while Janet fed her a handful of clover. When they reached a broken-hinged gate at the end of the lane, the girl began to realize that she was coming to the same place that Oliver had described to her. She stopped, feeling that she would rather not go on, but the little boy tugged at her hand. "'My father isn't here,' he told her 
as though some unhappy knowledge of his father's character made him understand her hesitation, and my mother's crying. With some reluctance, Janet pushed open the gate and went in. A faded, shabbily dressed woman sat on one of the unpainted benches of the shady stoop, holding a baby in her arms. As Marden had said, slow tears of helpless misery were rolling down her cheeks, while from the bundle that she held came the worn-out, tired wail of a sick child. "'I don't know much, but I would like to help you,' Janet said, sitting down beside her, while the woman choked with a fresh gush of tears at the unexpected offer of aid and sympathy. "'I don't dare put the baby down. He cries so,' she managed to say at last. "'Could you go into the kitchen and heat some water and bring out the blanket that I hung up to warm?' I don't doubt the fire is out by now, but I haven't been able to move for fear he would begin choking again. Do you think you can manage? Janet managed very well, with Martin trotting at her heels to tell her where things could be found. She heated the water, warmed the blankets, and even rummaged out the tea caddy and brewed a cup of hot tea for the weary mother. You are a real blessing, my dear said the woman, as she put down the empty cup. This boy has been sick with croup all night, and I had quite forgotten that I had no breakfast. "'Has his father gone for the doctor?' Janet asked, as she brought out a cushion for the baby, who seemed to be quieter now, and almost ready to drop asleep. "'No,' replied the woman briefly. She offered no explanation. It was evidently not a thing to be expected that Anthony Crawford should take an interest in an ailing child. As Janet went back and forth, she was struck by the surprising charm that the old house showed within, quite out of keeping with its littered dooryard and outward disrepair. The white woodwork had gone long unpainted, it was true, and the floors were worn and uneven, but there was an airy spaciousness in the rooms, a comfortable dignity in the old mahogany furniture, and the grace of real beauty in the curved white staircase with its dark, polished rail. Everything was spotlessly clean, from the faded rag rugs to the cracked panes of the windows. The kitchen was, to her, the place of chief delight, for it ran all across the back of the house, with a row of low windows wreathed in ivy, and commanding a wide view across the meadowlands beside the river. There was a modern cooking-stove at one end of the room, a cheap, hideous, ineffective affair, but at the other was still the old fireplace, with its swinging crane, its warming cupboards, and its broad, stone-flagged hearth. The baby was so much better that his mother was actually able to smile and to lean back contentedly in the corner of the bench. He is better off out here in the air, she said. I believe he will be able to sleep in a little while. Now, if I just had a strip of flannel to wrap around his chest, you would have to go up into the garret to look for it, and maybe rummage in one or two of the boxes. But I believe there should be some in the big cedar chest back under the eaves. Guided by the faithful Marden, Janet climbed the stairs to the garret where, in the warm, dusty air that smelled of hot shingles and lavender, she went poking about, seeking the roll of flannel that Mrs. Crawford assured her was there. She could find everything else in the world. Old clocks, spindle-legged chairs, a high-backed mahogany sofa, and a spinning wheel. At last she discovered what she needed in a box far under the eaves, but in pulling it out so that she could raise the lid, she knocked down a row of pictures that leaned against it. She bent to pick them up and set them in order again, then stopped to stare at them with a gasp of delighted astonishment. Janet loved beautiful things, especially pictures, and she could be sure at one glance that these were pictures such as one does not often see. She remembered being taken by her father to a famous gallery, to see a landscape so much akin to the one before her that they had undoubtedly been painted by the same artist, a green hillside with sailing clouds above it on a clear October day. The sort that makes you feel that you can see a hundred miles, as Janet put it. There was another, 
a winding white road, running up a wind-swept valley, with the trees bowing to a storm and a spatter of rain slanting across the hill. There was a portrait of a fierce old lady, and another of a man with lace ruffles and a satin coat. There was a long, cool wave, breaking upon a beach where the whiteness of the sun-splashed sand was so vivid as almost to hurt her eyes. She set them out in a row against the eaves, and sat back on her heels to look her fill. Such pictures, to be gathered here in the dusty attic, to crack and warp and fade into ruin! She could not understand how they could have come there, nor did she spend much thought in wondering, so lost was she in that pure delight that the sight of truly beautiful things can bring. An old print with a cracked glass and broken frame caught her attention almost the last of all. It showed a ship, a tall frigate under full sail, and had all the quaint primness of the pictures of a hundred years ago. The group of people supposed to be standing on the wharf was composed of gentlemen in very tight trousers, and ladies with very sloping shoulders and absurd tiny parasols. The vessel floated on impossible scalloped billows, but no old-fashioned stiffness could disguise the free beauty of the ship's lines and the grace of her curving sails. Her name was inscribed in faded gold letters below. The Huntress, 1813. The bee-man's tale was still so vivid in her mind that there was no need for her to wonder where she had heard that name before. "'Why, it was a real story!' she exclaimed, "'and I thought he was only making it up!' As she moved the print to a better light, a smaller picture, almost lost among the rest, fell down between two frames and rolled across the floor. She took it up and saw that it was a miniature, painted on ivory and framed in gold, the portrait of a young girl, with high piled brown hair and eager smiling eyes. It looks like Polly, Janet thought, but it could not really be a picture of her. She turned it over and found the single name engraved on the back. Sicily, Etatis, seventeen. Martin, she cried in the sudden inspiration of discovery, Martin, come here quickly and tell me what is your whole name. The little boy came out from a far corner where he had been examining dusty treasures on his own account, and stood for a minute just where a beam of slanting sunlight dropped through the tiny window under the roof. "'Martin Hallowell Crawford,' he said. She would always remember just how he looked, standing there with the sunshine on his yellow mop of curly hair, his chubby face smiling, and then widening suddenly as they both heard a sound behind them. She turned to see Anthony Crawford standing upon the stair. End of chapter 6、Chapter If Janet had needed any further clue to Anthony Crawford's character, she would have had it in the sudden trembling terror of his little son. She was shaking herself, yet she mustered an outward appearance of courage for a moment, as she turned to face him squarely and to hear his biting words. First the brother peering over the wall, then the sister rummaging through my house. Did Jasper Payton send you here to find where I kept the picture of Cicely Hallowell that he was so reluctant to give up to me? I didn't know it was Cicely Hallowell, returned Janet, trying to speak steadily. I didn't even know that she was a real person. I thought she was just someone in a story. Then, as Crawford stepped nearer, as little Marden gave a sudden squeak of alarm, blind panic took possession of her. She ran toward the stairs, and though the man put out his arm to intercept her, she dodged under it with undignified agility and plunged down the steps. They were of the broad, shallow kind that made her feel, for all her speed, that she would never reach the bottom. 
yet she came at last into the hall below and out upon the stoop. She fled past Mrs. Crawford, sitting with the sleeping baby across her lap and looking up anxiously, with good cause for misgiving, since she had heard her husband go up the stair. It was only when she was safely outside the gate that Janet stopped to draw breath, to realize how her knees were trembling and how her heart was pounding. Yet it stopped suddenly and seemed to miss a beat when she realized something further, that she still held in her hand the miniature of Cicely Hallowell. "'Can I go back?' she wondered desperately, but knew instantly that she could never find courage to do so. She went on, hurrying and stumbling, as she made her way down the lane. Only once she ventured to look over her shoulder, and saw Anthony Crawford standing on the doorstep staring after her, while the scarecrow that was so vaguely like him seemed to be lifting its straw-filled arm in a mocking gesture of farewell. Janet and Oliver held an anxious conference that evening as they sat on the terrace, for until that moment they had not been alone together. She brought out the miniature, and told of the astonishing and disturbing manner in which it had come into her possession, while Oliver wondered, in frank dismay, how it was to be restored to its owner. "'I can't think how I came to carry it away with me,' wailed Janet. "'Of course it was clutched tight in my hand, and I was so frightened that I didn't think of anything but getting away. I thought of putting it down on the grass by the gate, but it is too valuable to risk being lost like that. And that man will say I stole it. I don't know what to do.' "'We shall have to give it back to him,' said Oliver firmly. "'Tomorrow we will—' But he stopped in the middle of his sentence, unable even in imagination to contemplate facing Anthony Crawford and giving him the miniature. "'Shall we tell Cousin Jasper?' Janet suggested. But Oliver declared against it. "'Anthony Crawford will be quite ready to say that Cousin Jasper sent you to get it from him.' The miniature and the picture seem to be part of the trouble, though I don't understand why. So if that man comes here with such an accusation, it would be better for Cousin Jasper to be able to say he knew nothing about it." "'Yes,' assented Janet. "'I believe if he knew, Cousin Jasper would try to shield us, and Anthony Crawford would use it as one more thing to hold over him. I am beginning to understand both of them better. We. We have overlooked a good many things about Cousin Jasper." It was only a few minutes later that Cousin Jasper joined them. Nor had he yet sat down in the long wicker chair that Oliver placed for him, before Hotchkiss came out with the message. "'John Massey is in the kitchen, sir, and he says to tell you that he would like to see you about something important.' "'Bring him out here,' Cousin Jasper directed and when the somewhat embarrassed visitor in his worn best clothes appeared upon the terrace, he got up with as elaborate courtesy as he would have accorded the most distinguished guest. "'What is it, John?' he asked, for the sunburned farmer was evidently an old acquaintance. The other burst out with his news and his errand at once. "'I've been turned off, sir,' he said told to leave the farm, with no notice at all, and my crops all in the ground. I'll admit I'm a little behind on my rent, but not many landlords around here collect as closely as Mr. Crawford does. They get all their money at the end of the season, and don't haggle over it month by month when the farmer has nothing coming in. And what can you do on land that's never improved? He lets the place run down and then turns me out because I can't make a fortune for him on it. I... I was wondering if you couldn't do something for me, sir." "'Do something for you?' echoed Jasper Payton. "'I can't use any influence with Anthony Crawford, if that is what you wish.' "'I don't understand it,' the man persisted. Three years ago you were my landlord, and none of us ever had dealings with Anthony Crawford except that we used to know him when he was a boy. The whole bottom land along the river was yours and all your tenants were farming it for a fair rent, and everyone was satisfied. But then he comes, and the upper half is his, we hear, 
and it is bad luck for us, as we soon know. Everything runs down, no one is treated fairly, and here I am, turned off at a word, and all his doing. Couldn't you make room for me farther down the river somewhere, sir, where the land is yours? He looked so red and anxious and unhappy that Janet's heart was fairly wrung for him. His wife was ailing, she knew. The season was backward, and here he stood, facing the loss of all his work and the necessity of beginning all over again. She waited eagerly to hear what offer Cousin Jasper would make. "'I... I can't help you, John,' he said at last, very slowly and heavily. "'Even if I made room for you on one of the lower farms, it would only stir up trouble, and you might wake up some day to find that Anthony Crawford was your landlord again after all. I can give you the money to pay your rent, if you wish to stay where you are, but that is all I can do. There are times when we are none of us free agents or masters of our own affairs. I don't care to stay on, sir, John Massey returned. I've had too many words with Anthony Crawford for things ever to go easy again. I've been patching up the dyke with my own spare time, and maybe the farm has suffered by my doing it. Anyway, he says so and calls me a fool. I thought perhaps you would help me, since I'd been your tenant so long before he came. His voice, dragging with disappointment, trailed lower and lower. I don't seem to know just where to turn. Well, good night to you, sir. He turned and walked heavily away. They sat very silent after he was gone. Oliver was leaning against the terrace rail. Janet in her big chair was clenching her hands in her lap. Cousin Jasper, with his hands on the railing, stood in absolute quiet, staring out over the garden. The light of the house came through the long windows, falling on his face that was so pale and tired. He had seemed weary and unhappy for some time, but to-night he looked desperate. The minutes passed, but still he stood in silence, staring straight before him. The sight of his distress seemed more than either of the two could bear. Oliver could think of nothing to say, but stood dumbly helpless, while Janet moved closer to their cousin and spoke with shy hesitation. "'Couldn't we help you? Won't you tell us what you are thinking?' "'I was only thinking,' Cousin Jasper answered very slowly. "'I was wondering, as I do sometimes lately, how strangely life can change and twist itself, and make things seem other than they should be. If you have lived all your years following your own sense of honour, if you have tried in everything you do to be fair and just, how can it be, when the years have passed, that suddenly all the results of honest dealing should be swept away? How can it be that a man who has disgraced himself, whose ways are known to be everything that is devious and unfair, how can he gain power over you, threaten to take from you everything that is yours, even say that he can destroy your good name? How can every effort you make toward a fair settlement only render matters worse? Is there really something so wrong with the world that a dishonest man can work more harm than a man of honor can ever undo? Do you think so? He concluded, turning to regard them from under his knitted brows, as if he must, in his distress, find some word of reassurance somewhere. No, said Oliver emphatically, finding his voice somewhat to his own surprise. I don't think so at all. I believe a man who does dishonorable things can, can mix you up and make you miserable, but he can't go on forever. His plans are bound to come to grief in the end. His halting words carried the real earnestness of conviction. They seemed to give Cousin Jasper some sort of comfort, for his face relaxed. He moved from his tense attitude, and turned to walk up and down the terrace through the patches of light and shadow that lay between the windows. Janet thrust a friendly, affectionate hand under his arm as she walked beside him. 
it was a hot night, at June's very highest tide, with the garden at the summit of its beauty. The Madonna lilies were in bloom, showing ghostly white through the dark, rows and ranks and armies of them all up and down the walks and borders, sending sudden ripples of sweetness upward to the terrace whenever the faint breeze stirred. There was no moon yet, but the stars were thick overhead, and the moving lanterns of the fireflies glimmered among the trees, low down still as they always are in the first hours of the dark. Janet was thinking that when the world was so beautiful, it was difficult to believe that things could go entirely wrong in it, but she did not find it possible to put her idea into words. It may have been that Cousin Jasper was thinking the same thing as he stopped and stood for a long time at the head of the brick-paved stair leading down from the end of the terrace into the garden. At last he began to descend slowly, unable to make out the steps in the dark, so that he put his hand on her shoulder to steady himself. He spoke very suddenly. It is not only in body but in spirit that the old must sometimes lean upon the young, he said, and then, with his voice quite cheerful again, began to talk of how well the flowers were doing this year. Oliver had followed them to the top of the stair, and stood above them, listening, but not apparently, to what Cousin Jasper was saying. His head was bent, and he was straining every nerve to hear some far-off sound. His face looked troubled, then cleared suddenly as he came down the steps. "'Cousin Jasper,' he said, "'didn't I tell you that the gardener wanted you to know that the night-blooming Sirius is open just now? Suppose we walk out to the back of the garden and see it.' His cousin hesitated. "'It is rather late,' he answered. "'It will be open still to-morrow night.' "'Janet has never seen one,' persisted Oliver, putting a firm arm through Cousin Jasper's, and it might rain or something to-morrow night. She would be so disappointed, and so would the gardener. They went down the last steps together, into the sea of white lilies and drifting fragrance, and disappeared into the darkness toward the back of the garden. In spite of his insistence, Oliver did not seem so deeply interested as the others in the plant that was slowly opening its pink flowers, that have so brief and beautiful a season. The gardener, hastily summoned, came across the lawn to exhibit his favorite plant with the greatest pride. But Oliver left the others to admire and ask questions, and in ten minutes came back alone. Coming upon the terrace again, he saw Hotchkiss just inside the long window, ushering out a visitor who was talking in loud, easily recognizable tones. "'No, he doesn't seem to be here,' Anthony Crawford was saying, "'though I didn't believe you until you let me come in and see for myself. "'I had something of great importance to say to him, and to the girl. "'Well, I will come again to-morrow.' "'He passed down the room, and must have come very close to the light, "'for his shadow loomed suddenly, misshapen and bulky, all across the library, "'even dropping its black length over the terrace outside.' It followed him, a striding giant, from window to window, and then dwindled suddenly again as Anthony Crawford himself stood under the light in the doorway, giving Hotchkiss final directions. "'Be sure to tell him that I shall be here to-morrow night, and that I shall expect him to be at home,' he ordered, then climbed into the creaking cart and drove away. Hotchkiss stood peering into the dark after him, evidently sending no good wishes to speed him homeward. Seeing Oliver coming up the steps at the far end of the terrace, he walked down to speak to him. "'There was something more than usual wrong to-night,' he said anxiously. He vowed that he must see Mr. Payton, and didn't want to take my word for it that he was out. It was fortunate that he had gone into the garden." "'Yes,' responded Oliver. I thought I heard that miserable rattle-trap turning in at the gate, and I remembered all of a sudden that the gardener told me yesterday about the night-blooming Sirius. I... I thought they ought to look at it at once. 
Hotchkiss had been nervous and agitated during what must have been a stormy interview, and he found the sudden relief too great for the composure even of a butler. He burst into a great laugh of delight and slapped his knee in ecstasy. "'That was the way to serve him!' he cried. "'Do you think that prying scoundrel found someone that was too clever for him for once?' Oliver grinned broadly, but recovered himself in a moment. Hotchkiss, he said with great gravity, you would never do for the movies. Janet was eating her breakfast very deliberately next morning, lingering even after Cousin Jasper had left them, and while Oliver sat back in his chair fidgeting in frank impatience. When her brother finally urged her to make haste, she broke forth into an explanation that was almost a wail. "'It is because I can't forget where we have to go today,' she declared. "'Oh, why, why did I make such a terrible mistake and carry that miserable picture away?' Even Oliver looked none too cheerful at the prospect before them. "'We have to do it,' he agreed. "'But I think we will go over to the Windy Hill first. "'I promised Polly's father I would tell him what I saw from the boat. "'But after that there will be plenty of time.' and we will go to Anthony Crawford's. I ought to go alone, Janet said, for it was I who made the trouble. And shall we tell the bee-man? Not until afterward, replied Oliver. If there is difficulty about the picture, it would be easier if no one were concerned but just ourselves. And indeed you won't go alone. We are in this thing together. It had rained in the night so heavily that the clumps of larkspur and more tender plants were beaten down, and only the shower-loving lilies lifted their wet, shining faces above the green. The sky was still overcast, with threats of another downpour, yet the two put on their raincoats and set forth undeterred. "'There is an old apple-shed in the corner of the orchard where we can leave the car,' said Oliver. Polly showed me last time where we could drive in. The highway was smooth and wet, and the river was perceptibly higher under the bridge. They pressed onward, up the grass-covered road, drove through the gap in the orchard wall, and felt their way along the open lane between the apple trees. The car was finally housed in the shelter of the shed, and Janet and Oliver raced up the hill for the first drops of a new shower were just beginning to fall, and Polly, in the doorway of the cottage, was beckoning them to make haste. The downpour was a sharp one that pattered on the roof, ran streaming from the eaves, and blotted out the hills opposite. The grass in the orchard, however, seemed to grow greener every moment under the refreshing rain, and the clumps of pink hollyhocks that crowded about the doorstep lifted their heads gratefully. "'We can't do much with the bees for an hour or two, observed the bee-man, sitting down in the corner with his pipe. "'Now tell me what you saw on the river, Oliver. I noticed your sail and knew that you were out.' Oliver made his report upon the scouring banks, while the bee-man listened and nodded gravely. "'That is something we must look into,' he declared. "'It is like Anthony to have let things go. And now, if you have time to wait—' Suppose we have a story. They had ample time, they assured him, being only too glad to postpone the errand that must come later. They were eager for another tale, moreover, for they were beginning to realize that these were not mere haphazard narratives, but stories with some definite bearing upon the places and people about them. We have plenty of time, Oliver assured him. We are in no hurry at all, You might even make it a very long one. The bee-man nodded assent, with that queer smile that seemed to betray an uncanny understanding of the whole situation. A long one it shall be, he agreed, for I have a good deal to tell you. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of the Windy Hill by Cornelia Meggs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. 
The Fiddler of Apple Tree Lane People said that the Bryden children could never manage when it was said that they were planning to live in the little cottage on the hill above Medford Valley. "'There's always a wind there from the sea, dearie,' said old Granny Fullerton to Barbara Brighton. "'It will search out your very bones come winter.' Barbara shook her head cheerfully. A plump and rosy young person of twelve years old does not worry much about cold winds. People said also, with the strange blindness of those who can live close by for years and yet never know what is in their neighbors' hearts, that it was an odd thing that Howard Brighton should have built that little house so far from the town in the midst of that great stretch of wild land where so few folk lived. "'It is marshy in the valley and wooded on the hills,' Granny Fullerton said to Barbara, "'with never a neighbor for miles.' Of course the land has been in your family time out of mind, but those that are your nearest kin have always lived in the town. What could Howard Brighton have been thinking to do such a thing? They did not know how he had toiled and planned in his narrow little office down near the wharves of the seaport town, how he and his wife had dreamed together that their three children should live in some other place than on the cramped stony street where they had been born. After his wife's death he had still gone forward with his dream, and when he found that he had himself not very long to live, he had made haste to build the cottage that they had so greatly desired. "'It is pleasure enough to think of the children's having it,' he said to a plain-spoken neighbor, who remonstrated with him on the ground that he could never live there. The boys will be old enough to care for their sister, and the house on the hill will be just the place for a little maid to grow up. His children were of widely separated ages, for Ralph, the eldest, was twenty-one, Felix seventeen, and Barbara, as has been said, only twelve. It happened also that they had not all of them the same tastes, for while the two younger ones loved the country, and looked forward to living on the windy hill. Ralph's desire was to go on working in the dusty office where he had already begun to prosper. "'He is a good getter but a poor spender,' the neighbors said, and in this were right. Ralph, with his first success, had begun to think too much of money and too little of other things. In the end the cottage was never finished. Only the main portion, a tiny dwelling, was completed, without the two broad wings with which Howard Brighton had meant to enlarge it, and which he did not live to build. When their father had gone from them, his children found that he had left everything he had to Ralph, since the laws of seventy-five years ago made some difficulty over property being held by those who were not of age. Ralph has a wise head on his young shoulders, and will know how to take good care of the younger ones," was the comment of busy tongues. Perhaps Ralph heard them, with the result that he felt older and wiser than he really was, but of that no one can be sure. It was on a clear, warm day of mid-July when they moved from the airless street of the town to their new, wind-swept dwelling on the hill. "'It looks like home already,' Barbara said, as they came up to the door, for with its wide low roof, its broad windows, and its swinging half-doors that let in the sunshine and the fresh breezes, it seemed indeed a place in which to forget their sadness, and to find a new happy life. The rustling voice of the oak tree above seemed to be bidding them welcome, and a tall clump of hollyhocks by the doorstone, shell pink and white, seemed to have come into bloom that very day, just for their homecoming. Barbara ran from room to room, exclaiming in delight over the new freedom, while the two brothers sat on the doorstep to look down over their new domain and to talk of the future. Their father had planned to turn the meadow below into an orchard, and had even managed to set out the first half of the little trees slim tiny saplings that dotted the sloping green. 
We will put in the others next autumn and spring, Felix said, and I will be building new cupboards and shelves for old Chloe in the kitchen. I will mend the press in Barbara's room, and I will finish off the garret chamber under the eaves for myself. And there I can play the fiddle to my heart's content, and never disturb you at all. I think that life will be very pleasant here. So their lives swung into the new channel, with Chloe, Barbara's old nurse, to cook for them, and with Felix to tend the apple trees and the little garden, to saw and hammer and whistle all day at the task of setting the new place in order. "'It is a pity you haven't a proper handsome house, with long windows from the ceiling to the floor, and a high roof and a carved front door, and with black marble chimney-pieces instead of these rough stone fireplaces," Chloe would sigh, for she thought that the elegance of that time was none too good for the people she loved. It may be that Ralph sighed with her, but Felix and Barbara were frankly delighted with the painted floors, the casement windows, and the low, big-beamed rooms. In the evenings, as the two would sit on the wide doorstep, the voice of Felix's violin would mingle with the voice of the wind in the oak, while Barbara listened, entranced, for her brother was a real master of his instrument. It would laugh and sing and sigh, while Barbara pressed closer and closer to his knee, while the stars came out, and the evening breeze stirred the hollyhocks and the great branches of the oak tree. Ralph rode every day to the town, to labor over heavy account books in his cramped little office, and he always brought home a sheaf of papers under his arm. He would sit at the table inside the window in the candlelight, and as the music rose outside, singing to the child and the flowers and the stars, he would scowl and fidget and tap irritably on the table with the point of his pen, for he did not love his brother's playing. There is too much time spent on it, he would say, when you might be doing useful things. I have no head for adding up your endless columns of dollars and cents, Felix would answer, so I must make myself useful in my own way. A warm golden October had painted the valley with blazing colors, had turned the oak tree to ruddy bronze, and had afforded ideal weather for the further planting of the orchard. Here Felix was at work, with Barbara following at his heels and helping, when each tree was planted, to hold it upright while he pressed down the earth about its roots. "'We will leave an open space through the center, he said, a lane that will lead straight up toward the house, so that when Ralph and I come home we can look up to the open door and the hollyhocks around the step. Only—' he shook his head regretfully— I am afraid Ralph won't see the flowers. His head is too full of dollar signs when he comes home from the town." Barbara turned about to look through the orchard. Someone came trudging along between the little trees, his heavy, tired feet crunching in the leaves. "'Oh, it's a peddler!' she cried eagerly, for she was always pleased when these travelling merchants came past with their laces and gay embroideries and colored beads to dazzle the eyes of little girls. But this was a peddler of another sort, a dark-faced man with melting black eyes and eager speech that was less than half of it English. He was an immigrant Italian, newly come to this great America, he managed to explain, and he was trying to sell the trinkets and small household treasures that he had brought with him. They led him up to the house, for he was weary and hungry, and while Barbara brought him food, Felix was plying him with questions as to where he had come from and whither he was going. He had meant to settle down in the little seaport, so he told them, but here he became so voluble that it was almost impossible to understand him. He did not wish to stop there now. He must go on, on. It is the gold, he cried excitedly, making wide gestures with both his brown hands. The beautiful yellow gold, they find it everywhere. He brought out a tattered newspaper to let them see for themselves what he could not explain. 
news travelled slowly in those days, so that in this out-of-the-way corner of Medford Valley the brother and sister now heard for the first time of the discovery of gold in California. Yet in the towns, and where people could gather to tell one another ever-growing stories, the world was rapidly going mad over tales of gold lying loose for the gathering, of nuggets as big as a fist, of rivers running yellow with the precious shining dust. "'Listen, Barbara, why, it can't be true!' cried Felix as he read aloud, the Italian interrupting excitedly, trying to tell them more. It was for this that he had abandoned his plans, that he was selling everything he had, to follow a far golden dream across the country to California. "'A terrible journey, they say,' he admitted. "'But what does one care, with such fortune at the other end?' He had little left to sell, nor had they much money to buy. But so carried away were they by his ardor, they would have given him anything they had. There was a carved ivory crucifix, a silver chain, and at the very bottom of his bag, a square box that gave forth a curious humming noise. "'Take care,' he cautioned, as Barbara would have peeped within. "'They fly away. The bees!' "'Bees?' she echoed in astonishment. "'Yes, he had brought all the way to America, a queen bee and her retinue of workers, for Italian bees, he told them gravely, were known the world over for their beauty, industry, and gentleness. "'They sting you only if you hurt them,' he declared. "'Other times, never!' He explained how they were to be put into a hive, and just how they were to be tended, for he was wise in the bee-lore of Italy. Felix had seen some of the farmers round about struggling with the wild black bees, whose tempers were so vicious that the only way to gather their honey was to smoke the whole hiveful to death. The man opened the box a little way to let the yellow-banded creatures crawl over his fingers to show their gentleness. "'I must sell them quick,' he said, for they live not much longer in a box. They bought the bees, Felix and Barbara, though it took every penny they had in the house, and even the store and the little carved box on the mantel, which they were all saving, by Ralph's advice, against a rainy day. The man went away down through the orchard, turning to wave his ragged hat in joyful good-bye, for now he had sold everything, and was off and away to California. Felix sat on the doorstep, watching him go, while Barbara moved about inside, laying the table for supper. A thought suddenly struck her, and she went to the door. Felix, she said, I wonder what Ralph will say. But Felix was not listening. Gold, he repeated softly. Did you hear what he said, Barbara? The sands of the river's yellow with it, the Indians giving their children nuggets to play with, a year's earnings to be picked up in a day. He was so lost in his dream that he could talk of nothing else. It was not the sort of gold that Ralph loved, minted coins that could be saved and counted and stacked away, but it was the shining treasure of romance, wealth that, unlike dully satisfying riches, meant battle and adventure and triumph over overwhelming odds. He did at last consent to help Barbara house the bees in a suitable dwelling, but he talked still of the tale he had heard, and his eyes were shining with the wonder of it. Did you hear him say that there was just one beaten trail across the plains, all the way from the Mississippi to California? Think of a road, a single road, two thousand miles long, reaching out through the wilderness, over the deserts, through the mountains, with no towns or houses or people, just one lonely highway and gold at the far end. Ralph was late that evening, late and tired and impatient after an unsatisfactory day. He brushed past Felix, still sitting on the step, flung down his bundle of papers, 
and went over to the fire. The little carved money-box stood open on the mantel, revealing its emptiness. "'What is this?' he asked Barbara sternly, as she stood in the corner, twisting her apron and finding, suddenly, that it was very difficult to explain. Felix came in, the light of excitement still on his face, eager to tell the tale. He began to recount what they had heard, so carried away that he never noticed the gathering thundercloud upon his brother's face. The plains, the mountains, the shining rivers running to the sea. He seemed to conjure up all of them as he told the story, but Ralph's face never changed. So, cut in the elder brother at last, when the younger stopped for breath, it is for a fairy tale like this that you have wasted your time and your substance, have emptied my money-box. You bought bees with it, bees, to buy bees when the forest is full of them, and you can have a swarm from any neighbor for the asking. You spend my money that some lying rascal may be helped upon his way. It was our money, Felix reminded him gently, beginning to be awakened from his dream by the bitter anger of the other's tone. Mine, repeated Ralph. A cold fury seemed to possess him, which discussions over money could alone bring forth. Have you forgotten that everything here is mine, given me by our father? The bread you eat, the roof over your head, they belong to me. Do you understand? Barbara saw in the firelight that Felix's face flushed, then turned white. No one but herself could know just how such words would hurt him, how his pride, his love for his brother, and his sturdy independence were all cut to the very quick. He went out of the room without a word, and could be heard climbing the ladder-like stairs that led to the room he had made for himself under the eaves. Ralph sat down by the fire, muttering uneasily something about it all blowing over. With lagging steps, Barbara went on setting the table. They were not prepared to see Felix come down the stairs a few minutes later, with his coat and cap, and with his violin under his arm. "'I will take no man's charity, not even my brother's,' he said huskily, as he stood still for a moment on the threshold. Then he was gone." Barbara leaned over the half-door, and watched him go down the path, saw him pass through the lane of tiny apple-trees, saw the dusk gather about him as he went on, a smaller and smaller, plodding figure that disappeared at last into the dark. The autumn wind in the oak-tree sounded blustering and cold as she closed the door and turned back to the room again. "'He has only gone down to the town,' He will come back to-morrow, growled Ralph. But Barbara knew better. He has gone to look for gold, she cried, and sitting down on the bench by the fire, she buried her face in her hands and burst into tears. Felix used to think, as the days and weeks passed, and as that strange journey upon which he had launched so suddenly dragged on and on, that the grassy slope above the orchard, and the cool dark foliage of the oak tree, must be the very greenest and fairest things on earth. There was no green now before his aching eyes, only the wide stretch of yellow-brown prairie, a rough trail deep in dust winding across it, a line of white-topped wagons crawling like ants over the vast plain, and a blue arch of sky above, blinding bright with the heat. It was October when he went away from home. It was a month later when, by leisurely stage and slow canal-boat, he arrived at the Mississippi River, the outpost of established travel. Here he was obliged to wait until spring, for even in the rush of forty-nine there were few bold enough to attempt the overland trail in winter. He turned his hand to every sort of work. He did odd jobs during the day, and played his violin for dancing at night. He grew lean and out at elbows, 
and graver than he used to be. He slept in strange places, and ate stranger food. He suffered pangs of hunger and of homesickness, but he never thought of going back. His violin went everywhere with him, and in more than one of the little towns along the big river, people began to demand the boy fiddler who could make such gay music for their merrymakings. When at last the snow melted, the wild geese flew northward, and the wilderness trail was open again, he had no difficulty in finding an emigrant party to which to attach himself. Abner Blythe was a lean, hard Yankee, but he had lived for years in the Middle West, and had made journeys out into the prairie, although he had never gone the whole of the way to the mountains and the coast. He knew how to drive cattle with a long black snake whip, whose snapping lash alone can voice the master's orders, and which can flick the ear or flank of a wandering steer at the outermost limit of reach. His frail, eager-eyed little wife was to go with them, their boy of five, and a company of helpers who were to drive the wagons of supplies, and to serve for protection against Indians. The road was crowded at first, and the prairie grass grew green and high, full of wild strawberries, pink wild roses, and meadow larks. But as they journeyed slowly westward, as spring passed into summer, the green turned to brown under the burning sun, the low bluffs and tree-bordered watercourses were left behind, and they came to the wide, hot plains that seemed to have no end. At the beginning they sometimes passed farmhouses to the right and left of the trail, built by some struggling pioneer, where there was a little stream of water and where a few trees were planted. The places looked to Felix like the Noah's Ark he used to play with when he was small. The tiny toy trees, the square toy house, little toy animals set out on the bare brown floor of the prairie. Even the gaunt women in shapeless garments who always came to the door to watch the wagon train go by were not unlike the stiff wooden figures of Mrs. Noah. At last, however, even the scattered houses came to an end, and there was nothing before them but the wilderness. It was desperately hot, with the blazing sun above and the scorching winds swooping over the prairie to blow in their faces like the blast of a furnace. They made long stops at noontime, resting in the shade of the wagons, and pressed on late into the night so that not an hour might be lost. They went by herds of buffalo, big, clumsy, inert creatures, that looked so formidable from in front, and so insignificant from behind. They saw slim, swift little antelope, and on the far horizon they sometimes made out moving dots that must be Indians. Their numbers and their vigilance, however, seemed great enough to keep them safe from attack. A deadly weariness began to fall upon them all, so that Abner Blythe became morose and silent. His wife looked haggard and hollow-eyed. The men grew irritable, and the animals lagged more and more. Others who had passed that way had left many of their footsore beasts behind them, horses, oxen, cows, and sheep, to fall a prey at once to the great gray prairie wolves that hung behind every wagon train waiting for the stragglers who could not keep up. "'It is only the human beings who have the courage to go on,' Abner Blythe said to Felix. "'You would think that horses were stronger than men, and oxen the strongest of all. But the beasts give up and lie down by the road to die, yet the men keep on. It is not strength, but spirit that carries us all to our journey's end.' There was one high-spirited black mare, the dearly beloved of Felix's heart, who, whether dragging at the heavy wagon or cantering under the saddle, was always full of energy and fire. She was the boy's especial charge, and as the weeks passed, the two became such friends as are only produced by long companionship and unbelievable hardships endured together. It was a dreadful hour 
when, one night as they were making camp, the little mare lay down, and not even for a feed of oats or the precious lump of sugar offered her would she get up again. The very spirit that had driven her forward more bravely than the rest had produced greater exhaustion now. "'We will have to go on without her,' said Abner Blythe dejectedly, as they sat about the campfire. Felix was feeding the flame with the sparse fuel, and Anna Blythe, Abner's wife, was sitting on a roll of blankets with her child on her lap. The little boy was ill and lay wailing against her shoulder. "'Don't leave the mare,' Felix begged. "'A day or two of rest will cure her entirely. There is water here and grass beside the stream. We could camp two or three days until she can go on.' Abner shook his head wearily. "'We have no time to waste,' he declared. "'It is August now, and we must cross the mountains before the middle of September. We haven't a day, not even an hour, to lose.' Anna Blythe sighed a deep, quivering sigh. Felix knew that she loved the little horse, too, and so he sometimes thought she was herself so weary that she often longed to lie down beside the trail and perish as the tired, dumb animals did. She had never made complaint before, but to-night, perhaps appalled by the thought of the mountains still to be crossed, she burst out into fierce questioning. "'Abner, why don't we turn back? What is it all for? Can gold, all the gold we could ever gather, repay us for this terrible journey? We are little more than halfway, and the worst is still before us. We could go back while there is still time. Why do we go on? Abner, spreading his big hands upon his knees, sat staring into the fire. I don't know, he said at last. I vow I don't know. It is not the excitement, nor the gold that drives us. There is no telling what it may be. Our country must go on, she must press forward to new opportunities, she must dwell in new places. It is through people like us that such growth comes about, we don't ourselves know why. A little ambition, a little hope, a great blind impulse, and we go forward. That is all. They sat very still, while the fire died out into charring embers, and darkness filled the wide sky above them, showing the whole circling march of the stars like a sky at sea. "'We must be moving,' Abner said at last. "'We can make a few miles more before it is time to sleep.' They all arose wearily and made ready to go on. Felix went to where the black mare lay and passed his hand down her smooth neck, she whinnied and thrust her soft nose against his cheek, but would make no effort to move. He stood for a moment, thinking deeply. Very clearly did he understand Abner's unreasoning desire to go forward, but perhaps because he was only a boy, he did not feel that same wish so completely and passionately. There were other ideas in his mind, and uppermost among them was the feeling that one cannot desert a well-loved friend. Just as the foremost wagon creaked into motion and rumbled forward into the dark, his resolution found its way into words. "'I think I will stay with the mare,' he said. "'In three days at least she will be rested enough to go on, and then I can easily overtake you. We don't want to lose her.' He tried to hide the depth of his feeling with commonplace words. "'It would be sensible when we have so few horses.' Abner did not consent willingly, but he agreed at last. "'She'll travel fast when she is on her feet again,' he said, "'and I don't like leaving her myself.' Felix took some provisions from the cook's wagon, gathered up his blankets, slung his gun over his shoulder, and as a last thought reached in for his violin. It would be good company in the dark, he thought." Keep your gun cocked for Indians, were Abner's last instructions. Look out for rattlesnakes at the water-holes, and catch us up when you can. 
Good luck to you. The boy stood beside the trail, and listened to the slow complaining of the wheels, and the shuffling of the feet of horses and oxen in the dust, as the whole train moved onward. For a little while he could hear them, and could see the bulk of the wagon-tops outlined against the stars. Then the long roll of the prairie hid them, and he was left all alone in the wide, wild, empty plain. End of chapter 8